In the last episode of Land Speed Legends, we looked at the X-1, a pioneering rocket dragster that the Reaction Dynamics team built as a first step toward a full-sized rocket car to go after the land speed record. Craig Breedlove's 600 miles per hour. Now, it's late 1968. The X-1 has done its job of attracting sponsorship funding, and the Reaction Dynamics team is all set to go ahead with the project. Operation Land Speed Record. That's coming up. As always, before we get going, please subscribe to this channel if you haven't already done so. And if you're already on board, thank you. Okay, let's roll. Here's our three principals at Reaction Dynamics, Dick Keller, Ray Dosman, and Pete Farnsworth. These are the three main guys who will design and build the Blue Flame land speed rocket car. Young guys, all late 20s. Chuck Suba, who had driven the X-1 rocket dragster, he'd been slated to be the driver. He was to be the fourth key man on the team. But tragically, Chuck was killed in October 1968 in an unrelated drag strip crash, driving a piston engine dragster. So the Blue Flame driver slot is now open. Going into 1969, one of the many things the Reaction Dynamics team has to do is find a new driver. Okay, here's the heart of the new car, the rocket. That's Ray Dawsman holding the tiny 25 pound thrust rocket that he and Dick Keller started out with four years before. What they have now is obviously a whole lot bigger. It's also no longer a simple hydrogen peroxide rocket, a monopropellant rocket, like in the X-1. Ray Dosman and Dick Keller have added a second fuel, liquid natural gas, LNG, making it a bipropellant rocket. Why? Well, it made the rocket more powerful for starters, boosting its thrust to a whopping 22,000 pounds. It also made the project more attractive to sponsors, specifically to the natural gas industry, which has now agreed to pony up the cash. The projected budget? $184,000. The Blue Flame would demonstrate the power, the energy, that could be generated by clean, environmentally friendly natural gas. It would make the idea of natural gas exciting. Here's how the rocket worked. Concentrated hydrogen peroxide is used for the initial reaction. This isn't the antiseptic hydrogen peroxide you can buy at the drugstore. That's 3% concentrated. This stuff's 90% concentrated. Dab it on a wound and it'll eat your skin off. So this concentrated hydrogen peroxide, it hits a silver mesh screen and there's an instant reaction that breaks it down into oxygen and water. Boom! And you've got thrust. That's what happened in the X-1 rocket. That was the whole thing. In the Blue Flame rocket, this was just the first step, the first stage, a way to generate oxygen that could feed an even bigger blast in the second step, when liquid natural gas, in gaseous form here, and liquid form here, is sprayed into the combustion chamber and ignited. So in the Blue Flame's rocket, the hydrogen peroxide is being used as an oxidizer and the liquid natural gas is the fuel. Okay, so that's the rocket. Now, the body. The Reaction Dynamics team started out with this idea. Fins and curved lines all over the place, really far out. As they get down to more serious design work, though, the lines start to straighten out. The blue flame becomes a simple, clean pencil, a dart shape, like this. It's a basic tricycle configuration, the best configuration for a land speed car, 
the most inherently stable, rear wheels far apart, front ones close together. It's hard to tell, but the Blue Flame actually does have two wheels in front, right up against each other. So there'll be none of that carping that Craig Breedlove experienced with his first Spirit of America jet car. Oh, it's only got three wheels. It's not a car. The Blue Flame's got four wheels, baby. It's a car. End of story. Before construction was begun on the Blue Flame, a small brass model was fabricated and tested in a wind tunnel at Ohio State University to confirm the configuration. These tests revealed that the fairings on the rear wheels and the aerodynamic coverings over the struts actually destabilized the car, making it want to fly up off the ground. So they were removed from the design. The finished car would have exposed rear wheels and struts. The project moved from the design phase to construction in January 1969. Work in Reaction Dynamics Milwaukee shop would proceed along two main tracks, the car's chassis and the rocket. By this time, the power of the rocket had been cut back from 22,000 pounds of thrust to 13,000 pounds by installing a different component that delivered a smaller amount of liquid natural gas. The team was confident that this would still be more than enough to get them well past the record, maybe even take them up to 700 miles per hour. And for now, for the first phase of record-breaking, that was all that they needed. They didn't want to go any faster than that because 700 miles per hour is getting into the transonic zone, a potentially dangerous place. The aerodynamic pressures acting on the car might do strange things to it as it approached the speed of sound, about 750 miles per hour on the ground. The Blue Flame team doesn't want to go there until they see how the car performs first in the 600 mile per hour range. That's why they go with the lower rocket setting of 13,000 pounds of thrust. They don't want the Blue Flame to go too fast. While this construction work is going on, the team is also looking for a new driver to replace Chuck Suba. A number of names were considered, including five-time land speed record holder Craig Breedlove and drag racing giant Don Garlitz. In the end, the driver's slot went to a somewhat lesser-known guy named Gary Gablich, who had a lot of experience driving top fuel dragsters, high-speed boats, and Bill Frederick's Valkyrie jet car. He was also a good-looking guy, an attractive face and personality to go along with the car and all the advertising the gas industry had planned. Gary signed the contract with Reaction Dynamics in June 1969. According to the terms, he would get an upfront retainer of $1,000, $2,500 for driving the car, an appearance fee of $1,000 per day plus expenses if he broke the record, and a one-third share of all monies earned from advertisements and endorsements. Oh, and there'd be an insurance policy, too, $100,000 in the event of his death. All this took nearly two months to negotiate. Thank you for signing the contract, Dick Keller wrote to Gary after the deal was ironed out. Now, let's get famous. The Blue Flame wasn't ready in time to make its record attempt at Bonneville in the 1969 season. The Reaction Dynamics team had anticipated this. In their proposal to the American Gas Association, the fall of 1969 was mentioned only as a provisional target, and the fall of 1970 as a fallback. In the contract the AGA subsequently drew up, however, a clause was added stating that if the car wasn't ready in time to run in 69, ownership of it would revert to the sponsor, the AGA. Dick Keller, Ray Dosman, and Pete Farnsworth signed the contract without really noticing this clause down in the fine print. Remember, these were just young guys, not all that business savvy, still in their 20s. Then the fall of 1969 comes and goes, the American Gas Association takes ownership of the car, and the Reaction Dynamics team 
realize they've made a huge mistake. They've just lost control of the blue flame, their creation. Going forward, they'll be working for a weekly paycheck and land speed glory alone. Losing ownership of the Blue Flame resulted in Ray Dawsman leaving the project in January 1970. Ray, unlike Dick and Pete, wasn't interested in fast cars and racing and land speed glory. His thing was rockets. According to Dick Keller, Ray left because losing ownership of the car scuttled any chance of turning reaction dynamics into a profitable rocket manufacturing business which was Ray's ultimate goal. Ray tells a different story. He says the American Gas Association, the car's new owner, wouldn't approve of the rigorous testing program he had planned for the rocket. It was too expensive, so he left. Here's what the Blue Flame looked like in January 1970. Nearing completion, but still not done yet. The fall of 1970 is now the new target. The plan is to first break Craig Breedlove's 600 mile per hour record, then to go for 700. After that, the sky was the limit. By returning the rocket to its full power, 22,000 pounds of thrust, and installing a larger LNG fuel tank, the Blue Flame team believe they can hit speeds of over 900 miles per hour. And so, the countdown to the Bonneville Salt Flats begins. <laughs>